let's dive into what God has for us uh, this morning. Um, it was uh, one of his best friends, and uh, they'd only known each other for just a few years, but it was like they clicked, you know? And uh, this relationship was even more special because he didn't just love his friend, he also loved his friend's family, and they loved him. Anybody, I don't know if you had a relationship like that, where it's like, yeah, I like you, but I really like your family. Uh, that, that's what this was. You know, you go over and get the free meals. It was one of those sorts of relationships. And um, it, it seemed like just yesterday that his friend was fine, and then he gets word that his friend is sick, and then two days later, his friend is dead. And by the time Jesus gets to Bethany, to the hometown of his now dead friend Lazarus, uh, Lazarus' sisters run out to meet him. And Martha, in typical Martha fashion, you know, Martha comes out angry and accusatory and just starts yelling at Jesus in the middle of the street and just says, Lord, if you had just been here with us, then my brother wouldn't have died. And right behind her is Mary. And I have to imagine Mary was a little bit more of the likable sister. And Mary's surrounded with the family, with the friends, with the mourners, and, and almost just numbness of what's happened. She just kind of echoes her, sis, her sister and just says, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And we're told that Jesus kind of takes in the moment. He takes in all the mourners and the sadness and the grief and the sisters. And we're told that Jesus is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then we get the, the shortest uh, verse in the English translation of the Bible, Jesus wept. And, and this is not like Jesus was cutting an onion, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, ooh, you know, like a little trickle. Like Jesus' ugly face sobs over the loss of his friends. He takes in the moment and Jesus loses it. And then we're told that then he goes to Lazarus' tomb where again, Jesus is deeply moved. And then if you know how the story pans out, like Jesus goes on and uh, he raises Lazarus from the dead, right? Because that's what Jesus does when he shows up on the scene. Jesus comes and he does Jesus stuff, right? Like Jesus stuff. Like when Jesus shows up, dead people get out of tombs and the blind are healed and, you know, the lost are found, all that sort of stuff. But Jesus weeps. We kind of like breeze right past that part of the story, don't we? Like, like we don't know what to do when God has an emotional breakdown, what do you do when the God who spoke creation into existence cries? What do you do when Jesus puts a do not disturb sign on his life and is like, hey guys, I just need to go there for a moment. I, I need a second. Can you just give me a minute? I need to weep. I need to mourn. Because Jesus was no stranger to crisis, right? Jesus was no stranger to chaos. Jesus was no stranger to pain because then he turns to us, right? You know what he says to us? He says, hey guys, in this world, you will have troubles. Anybody found that one out yet? Right? About seven of you. Okay, good. All right. The rest of you, just go ahead and put it on your calendar for this month. You're going to have some troubles. All right. That's not like a prophecy. That's a reality that there, if there's one common experience that kind of knits us together, it's that we've all shared tragedy. We've all shared crisis. We've all shared pain because in this world, we will have troubles. All right. Maybe your crisis was the loss of a marriage. Maybe your crisis was the loss of a relationship. Maybe, maybe you were climbing the corporate ladder and you had the dream all set out there before you and you were going full speed ahead and you're like, I know it. I know this is what God has for me. And then you lose the job and you're like, God, but I thought you said, God, I thought that was the dream. And now the creditors are circling like buzzers, man. It's crisis. Or maybe, maybe you sinned. You ever sinned before and it's like, how could I, what in the world was I thinking? Now the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, the crisis of the heart. Or maybe you suffered abuse. Maybe that was your crisis. Maybe physical abuse or emotional abuse or sexual abuse. Or maybe you got burned by a pastor. Maybe even right now you're watching this online at a later time because a church hurts you. And now that's just how you do church now. You can't be here in the assembly. Or maybe somebody was this close to you, and then they died. It's crisis. It hurts. Sometimes life hurts. We were just in Ethiopia, and uh, if you want to go to a place that knows crisis, go to a place like that. And um, there uh, we learned of one of the local men who, who lost a child in May and lost a child in June 
and then lost a child in August, and then his wife died last year too. And at this last funeral, only five people came because they're so weary of his family's crisis. Now it's just him and one son remaining. And what do you do with that crisis? There in Ethiopia, we met a, a little girl, and I say like little girl, like tiny, like she looked like she was eight, but she was 16. And um, um, when she was little, 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 uh, her mother died of AIDS, and she was born with HIV. And uh, she found herself out on the street as a tiny tiny little girl uh, with nobody to look after her. And she's walking around, she's begging for food, she's begging for money. And there on the street, she finds out that the other little girls let men touch them for money so that they can buy bread. And she finds out that she can do the same. And so for a dollar a man, she lets them touch her and do things to her so that she can buy food to put in her belly. And even though she's lived five lifetimes by now, now she's 16 years old and has been off the street for six months in the program that Victory started over there to get the girls out of the red light district, get the gospel in them and get them in a different trajectory in life. But what do you do with that? Like that's crisis, that's crisis. I mean, sometimes life hurts, right? Can we say that? Some, have, have, you ever, have you ever had like life happen and you just want to like wave the white flag? You're like, I give up. Like I surrender. Jesus, take me home. Like we can say that. Can we just be honest in church? Like, have you ever prayed the prayer like Jesus, it would be okay if I died right now? It would. I have prayed that prayer. Okay. I have prayed the prayer, like the crisis, the stress, the pain, whatever is just so much. And I'm like, Jesus, it would be totally fine if like a comet fell out of the sky like, like Looney Tunes, you just like killed me because then I'm going to go and be with Jesus. I would be fine with that. Like, you ever been there where like just sometimes life hurts, crisis feels overwhelming. And it's in that time I'm reminded of what Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so it's not like I'm wrong because to die is to gain because to, to die is to see Jesus face to face, but to live is Christ. And it's with that I'm reminded of Paul's charge to us. And it's a charge we've been on for a few weeks. And it's a charge that may be seemingly impossible for a lot of us in this room because of the crisis we've been through in life. But it's a charge that if we'll let it today, it's going to take us to a really good place. It's a charge found here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Let's go there. This is, this is Paul's charge and God's charge to us through this. Philippians chapter 3. He's talking about what lies ahead of him. And Paul says this, not that I've already obtained all this. I, I haven't stepped into the future yet or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus already took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And what Paul's saying is this, is that much like a, a runner finishes a race and he goes across the finish line and he gets the trophy. He says, one day, guys, I will cross the finish line of this life. I will close my eyes here on earth and I will go up and I'll see Jesus face to face. He will be my prize. He will be my trophy. And it's in light of that coming day, that one day I will, I will step into that reality that it reminds me that today I have to let go of my yesterdays and I have to put down my pain. I have to put down the stress. I have to put down the abuse. I have to put down the hurt. I have to put down the rights. I have to put down the wrongs. I have to put down the crisis and I have to forget the past so I can move forward. That's what he's saying. That's the charge to us today is forgetting the past and moving forward. And just so we don't get hung up on that forget, as we dive into the Greek, that word forget isn't really forget. It means not to focus on. So what we're saying today is this, is that by God's grace, we're not going to focus on the past any longer and we're going to move forward. We're going to break the connection between our past and our future. We're going to break the stranglehold that our past has even on our present, and we're going to move forward. Because if we're ever going to move forward in this life, we ha we're going to have to learn how to move forward through crisis. We have to learn how to move forward after crisis. Because we know this. May we know people like this. Maybe we're people like this. That something happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But it's just as fresh as if it happened yesterday. Right? And we may be 20 years older in the flesh, but we're still chained 20 years ago in our heart to that thing that happened. 
And what we're saying again, by God's grace today, is we're gonna break the chains from our past off of our future. And we're gonna leave here today, I believe this free to step into the future that God has for us as we move forward through crisis. Um, but we're gonna do this thing a little differently. As we're asking this question, how do I move forward after crisis? We're gonna do this a little differently. We're gonna actually start at the end and then we're gonna work our way back, all right? We're actually gonna start at the hardest thing to do and then we're gonna move back to, to talk about the thing that's gonna enable us to do that. So if you're used to a three-point message, we're gonna start at number three, all right? Deal with it. You're like, I don't know how to do that. Okay, just write down number three, okay? We're gonna start at the hardest thing to do and then we're gonna move backwards. We're gonna move back to start, talk about the thing that's gonna enable us to get there. We're gonna go three, two, one today. So how do I move forward after crisis? How do I move forward after crisis? The third thing is this. Number three is I have to choose joy. I have to choose joy. Now here's the deal. That word choose is really intentional, all right? Uh, because it doesn't come naturally to do this. If it came naturally, we already would have done it. If we could get ourselves unstuck from crisis, we already would have done it by now, right? And so we're gonna have to make some decisions today. And the third thing, the last thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to choose joy. And here's where we get that from. James 1, verse two. James says this, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. Opportunity, okay. An opportunity is not guaranteed to happen, but it is an opportunity for something to happen. So we have an opportunity here. And what do we have an opportunity for? Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. We do that, right? Like something bad happens and we're like, yes, it's awesome. We're so excited excited when bad things happen. No, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Why is it an opportunity? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. In other words, I choose joy, not because of what my crisis is, but because of what God can accomplish through it. That's why I choose joy. I choose joy not because of what my crisis is, but because of what God can accomplish through it. My crisis hurts. My crisis is painful. I would not wish my crisis on my worst enemy. But here's what I believe. I choose joy not because of what my crisis is, but because I believe that God is working something in me and through me that is fantastic, even though I can't see it right now. And so I choose joy. I choose joy. And here's, here's the deal with crisis, guys. Here's the deal with crisis. I love this about crisis. And here's something, especially in this room, here's what we have to grab a hold of. Crisis puts believers on display so the world can see how we do it differently than they do. That's what crisis does. That's the opportunity that we have with crisis is that crisis puts Christians, real Christians on display for the world to see how we do it differently than they do. I love this. And here's the opportunity of crisis. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. It's a good word today, comfort. Who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. In other words, an opportunity we have is that when God comforts us in the midst of crisis, we can then turn around and share that comfort with other people. That is a beautiful thing to, to be able to say, hey, I, I've hurt too, but let me just tell you some really good news and share comfort that God has given you. That's a really good thing to be able to share. And the, and the reality is believers, crisis puts us on display for the world to see how we do it differently than they do. And um, you know, we had a, a family here in the church and um, there's, there's a lot of crisis, but we, we had family here in the church at the beginning of the year um, a lot of you are aware of this, who um, went through a crisis and lost their daughter. And unimaginable pain, unimaginable crisis. But I was talking with the dad after the funeral. He said, you know, you don't understand how many um, atheists there were in the room and how many church hurt people there were in the room at the funeral. And he said this, and I, in fact, I've, I've talked with some of you uh, out here, we're on the other side of this, and so welcome if you're here. Um, but he said, you know, I can't tell you how many people who, who came out to us and just said, hey, what church do you go to? 
And here's what they're really saying. Here's what they're really saying. You just don't have the words to, to, to say it like this. You're handling this differently than I would because the way that you're going through your pain is impossible for me to do. I think I need to know your God. Where can I go to meet him? What church do you go to? And that is something I can rejoice in. That's something I can choose joy in, not because of what my crisis is, but because of what God can accomplish through it. That I can rejoice in the fact that I can let my light shine even in the midst of crisis and pain and suffering and others will see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. I can rejoice in that. I can choose joy in that and I can find joy in that even in the midst of the pain, I can choose joy because God is working through this to accomplish something fantastic. I believe that. But here, here's the idea. If we're ever gonna choose joy, we're gonna have to do something else first. Three, two, we're gonna have to do something else before we choose joy. Before we choose joy, here's the other thing we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to choose to trust. We're gonna have to choose to trust, All right? This is faith. This is kind of like the, the glue that holds us moving forward together is, is actually having faith here, having trust. You know what? what? What enabled Abraham to leave everything he had ever known to go to a land that he had ever known? He trusted God. He had faith in God. He's the father of faith. What enabled Joshua to actually go in and, and, and inhabit the promised land, to see the walls of Jericho fall, to slay the giants because he was strong and of good, good courage. Why? Because he knew that the Lord as God was his was with him everywhere he went. He trusted that. He trusted that God was with him. What enabled David, even in the midst of a horrible fall, an affair, to actually get back up, dust himself off, put one foot in front of the other, and to move forward? He trusted. What did they trust? Here's what they trusted, guys. They trusted that their future was going to be better than their past. They trusted that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Because here's the idea, guys. If we don't believe that the future is going to be better than the past, we're going to stay in the past. We're going to stay at the miscarriage. We're going to stay at the divorce. We're going to stay at the abuse. We're going to stay right at that place and say, I don't think I can ever move forward. I don't think I can even really live another day because I don't see how it could ever get better after this. But we're here today to say, I trust. I trust. I trust that the future is going to be better in the past. Let me walk you through three quick Romans 8 scriptures here. Here's how we trust. Romans 8, 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. In other words, I believe this. I believe this. Here's what we're saying. I trust that where God is leading is better than where I am leaving. I trust that. I trust that. I trust that. That's what Paul is saying right there. I trust that this thing, in light of eternity, it's light and momentary. I know it's crushing. I know it's painful. I know it hurts. I know it's nagging. I know, I know it feels like there's a chain around my heart. But here's what I trust. In light of eternity, in light of what I will receive, man, this, what I trust this, that where God is leading is better than where I'm leaving. And so I put one foot in front of the other and I move forward. I move forward. How am I able to do that? Fast forward a few verses later, Romans 8, 28. Now here's the deal, listen, listen. Romans 8, 28, this is the one that people like to say at funerals. And everybody gets upset with them because it's not the time to say it at a funeral. But here's the deal, listen now so you can believe later. All right, get this in your heart now so it becomes a deep truth to you. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God works everything together for the good. Paul never says that it is good. Paul never says that the crisis is good, but only God has a way of working it together for our good. We have to trust that. I have to trust that. Listen, God is the only one who can do this. God is the only one who can bring good out of bad, all right? A person can't do that, a pastor can't do that, your spouse can't do that, your job can't do that, nothing can do that except for God. And here's what we have to trust, even when we look at our life and all of our circumstances say that, man, this thing is broken, it can never get better. I have to believe that God is working this together for my good because God is the one who calls things that are not as though they were. And God is the one who makes a way where there is no way. And with God, all things are possible. What's impossible with man is possible with God. And here's Here's what I'm saying. When I look at my life and I see bad, 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 I trust that God's working it together for my good. That's what I trust. I trust that. 
Nobody else can do that. Only God can do that. That's, that, that's, that's why we, we trust. That's why we have faith because God's the God of the impossible. And when I look at my life, I see broken relationship, broken relationship, financial problems, job problems, life problems, health problems. I believe God's working it together for my good. I believe that. I trust that. I trust that. Even when all my circumstances say it could never get better, I trust that God's working it together for my good. I trust that. That's what trust is. Trust is. And how are we able to trust that? Fast forward just a few verses later, verse 38. This is so beautiful. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell itself can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How am I able to trust? How am I able to trust all that? Because I believe this, even when all of my circumstances say that God has abandoned me, I trust that God is right here. God is right here and he's never even gone anywhere. And even when God is extraordinarily silent, I believe that he is not absent. Hear that today. Even when God is silent, he is not absent. I trust that. I trust that. Even when all my friends are around me and social media is blowing up and be like, how could you still be a Christian? How could you worship a quote unquote God like that? How could you still go to church? Had you look at your life, you look at all the things that have happened, that's what a good God does. I trust I trust that life itself and death itself, not even the powers of hell itself, could ever separate me from his love. And even when it feels like he's a million miles away, I choose to trust that he's right here. And so I will not pray as if God is absent. I will pray as if God is present. I will not pray and just say, well, God, if one day if you ever remember me, or God, one day if this, or God, would you please not forget me any longer? I, I pray, I just say, God, all my circumstances, even my own emotions, my own heart, it, it, it's wanting me to believe that you're nowhere around here, but God, today I believe this and I choose to trust, God, that even in your silence, I believe that you are not absent, and so I will pray as if you are right here, and so I thank you for being right by my side, that you'll never leave me and you'll never forsake me, you'll never turn your back on me. Even when everybody else has, God, I choose to trust you today that you're right here. And if we're ever gonna make it through crisis, we're gonna have to learn to trust. We're gonna have to learn to trust. We're gonna have to learn to trust that God's promises are still true. We're gonna have to learn to trust that God has not left us. And we're gonna have to trust that where God is leading us is better than where we're leaving. We're gonna have to trust that, trust that. But on the road to trust, and before, definitely before we can choose joy, we're gonna have to do something else first, three, two, one. We have to do something else first. As we trust, and definitely before we choose joy, there's something else we have to do first. And it's something counterculture. It's something we definitely don't talk about in the church very often. But I believe, again, if we'll allow it, it's going to take us to a really good place today. Before we choose trust and before we choose joy, the first thing we have to do is we have to choose to mourn. We have to choose to mourn. That one never gets a really loud Amen. You know, I, when I'm reading the scriptures, I like to kind of paint the picture in my mind, and I just imagine it was a gloomy day that Jesus rolls into Bethany, um, where Lazarus has died and where Jesus weeps. And, you know, as Jesus weeps, he's really just taking his own advice, because Jesus is the one who gathers the people on the hillside there off the Sea of Galilee, right beside Capernaum, in this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us this thing called the Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, he tells us in Matthew 5, 4, he says this. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You ever read anything in the Bible and you're like, "Mm, nope, don't agree with that one. Right? You ever read something and you're like, Jesus, you were right pretty much about everything else except for that one. I don't agree with that one. That, that's my response to this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. And especially when you, when you really dig into it, and that word for mourn is the Greek word pentheo. Blessed are those who pentheo. That word pentheo is actually the, the, the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language. 
Uh, it's the word associated with the death of a loved one, pretty much the, the, the closest one to you, pentheo. Uh, pentheo is, um, you know, you, you ever mourn or you ever sad and you try and choke it back and you kind of keep it right behind here? That's not pentheo. Pentheo demands to come out. Pentheo has to come out through tears. Pentheo has to come out through the groan of the mouth, through the broken heart. There's just pentheo. And Jesus says, blessed are those who pentheo. Blessed are those who pentheo, for they will be comforted. And in this, hear this. Hear. Jesus not only says it's okay to mourn, he said that we should mourn. Because blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now listen to this. You may have never been told this before. Hear this. Today, Jesus gives you permission to mourn over your miscarriage. Jesus gives you permission to mourn over being raped. Jesus gives you permission to mourn over the abuse. Jesus gives you permission to mourn over the loss of a dream, loss of a career. Jesus gives you permission to mourn over that child who has gone away that is breaking your heart. Jesus gives us permission to mourn over our sin. And Jesus gives us permission to mourn over the loss of somebody who is this close. They're not here anymore. Jesus not only says it's okay, he says we should because it's blessed, because we'll be comforted. Let's answer this question, why do we mourn? Why do we mourn? You know, we live in a world that, uh, that tries to avoid pain at any cost, right? We live in a world that avoids crisis, that wants to get back to normal as fast as possible, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, hey, go cry your little tears at the funeral, but then get back to work on Monday, right? Hey, go be sad for a second, but then come back. You gotta get back to normal as fast as possible. Do whatever you have to do to get back to normal as fast as possible. Drink it away, right? Smoke it away, drug it away, entertain it away, eat it away, Oprah it away, right? Soap opera it away, Big Mac it away, five guys it away, whatever you gotta do. I'm talking about like, like get back to normal as fast as possible, sedate the pain, get back to normal. And whatever you do, don't be the guy who's still sad two weeks later. Don't be that loser, right? Get back to normal. And here's the reality. Can I just say this? We've been just as bad, if not worse, in the church. Because you know what we do? What we do in the church? We jump people past one and two and we jump them straight to three. Hey, brother, take joy. We jump them straight to joy. No, don't mourn. Don't trust. Just go straight to joy. Hey, brother in the Lord, hey, choose joy today because God's doing something fantastic. <laughs> right? And we say the dumbest things. And then we go to funeral and say the dumbest things. All right? Have you ever, have you ever been the guy? I hope not. Don't tell me if you are. Who shows up at a funeral and is like, well, I guess, I guess the Lord just needed him more in heaven than we did here. Shut up! <laughs> the Lord doesn't need him in heaven. What's wrong with you? God's not lonely, right? I'm not trying to be insensitive, but think it through. God's not up there like, oh, I'm really lonely. I, I have lack. I know I'm God and I'm perfect in all my ways, but I'm really lonely today. I should probably kill somebody. Okay, come on up, right? That's not how it works. Is our face so shallow that we feel like we have to put words in God's mouth? Then we have to try and explain everything away. Hey, I know, you know, I don't, I don't know. I guess God just needed a more in heaven. No, he didn't. Can we just admit that we live in a broken world that has been increasingly fractured since the fall in Genesis? And man, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I can't explain that. I can't put my finger on it. Obviously, we live in a world where we have an enemy who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Sinful things happen. Broken things happen. I don't know, and I'm not going to try and put words in God's mouth, but my faith is strong enough still to trust and still to choose joy at the end of the day, but i got to choose to mourn first. Come on. 
And I'm not going to try and speed you through your suffering and jump you straight to joy. Because you know what happens when we skip mourning? We skip our blessing. Because blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Don't skip your mourning. Because when you skip your mourning, you skip your blessing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And Jesus never tells us to sweep it under the rug, right? Act like it never happened. Because you know what happens when you sweep stuff under the rug? It's still there, right? Now there's just a bump under the rug. You ever live with somebody, maybe a spouse or roommate, who cleans up, but their clean up is like throw everything in the closet, right? And then you open up the closet, <laughs> it all comes out. You didn't clean up, you just moved it, right? It's not clean, it's just, now there's a bump under the rug. This is what we do with our pain so many times. We, we take our pain and we put it in a box, right? And then we put the box in the attic underneath all the other boxes. And we say, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna feel that. Whenever those emotions come back up, no, 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 I'm good. That's in the attic. I don't have to deal with that anymore. That's in the basement. That's, that's put away. That's behind lock and key. I don't have to deal with that anymore. But there's still a bump under the rug. You know, there, there's actually a term called proud flesh proud flesh, P-R-O-U-D, proud flesh. Uh, it's actually a veterinarian term. This is one of those times that, that, that science caught up with gospel. And what it is, um, it's actually a condition found in horses. You can even Google it, proud flesh. Be careful, the pictures are disgusting. Um, and so what happens is a horse will be going along and it'll snag, snag itself like on barbed wire or something. It'll be an open wound. And here's literally the definition of, of proud flesh, is that the outside of the wound heals faster than the inside of the wound. And what happens is you have a horse that looks completely normal on the outside, but it's festering and infected right beneath the surface. And everything is fine until you touch it. Just like us. Just like us. And this is how somebody like me can stand up here on the stage and I, I talk about reconciling cultures talk about putting the races back together and the cultures back together and somebody can come out in the lobby and tell me how insensitive I was and chew me out and say you don't know what I've been through and, and what it did it brought all the memories back about that time that she brought her boyfriend home and her boyfriend was black and her parents rejected him and, and I talk about kids and then the mom who's had three miscarriages just comes out talks to me in the lobby how dare you be so insensitive what is called is unmourned crisis unmourned crisis this is what it's like. It's proud flesh. Well, you ever have a conversation with somebody and you're just talking, everything's fine, and then they smell something or you say something or you touch them on the shoulder. All of a sudden, they freak out. Don't do that. What are you talking about? Why'd you say that? It's proud flesh. This happens all the time in marriage. <laughs> right? Everything's fine. And then you say something that reminds, and then it's like the tornado of Hades comes out. Oh, what just happened? What in the world? And then, you know, they turn into Darth wife, like. <laughs> where did that come from? It's proud flesh. It's just right underneath the surface and everything looks fine until you touch it. Proud flesh. And here's the reality, guys. The pain, the crisis, something will happen with it. I was actually talking with a surgeon uh, who comes here to the church. He told, heard me talk about this. He says, yeah, I actually drain these sorts of wounds all the time in people. I didn't know it was called proud flesh, but he says, the dangerous thing is if you don't treat it, he said, actually this, he says, it's, he said, I've never seen the gospel in this. He said, the, the dangerous thing is that if you don't treat an infection, there, he said, there's little colonies of, of parasites that can actually get on the valves of the heart. And if crisis doesn't find a way out, you know, then, then, then it'll still find a way out through, through unforgiveness and bitterness and being jaded. But if you keep it in, it's like keeping toxins. It's like keeping poison inside. And it'll, it'll hurt your heart. It'll cause ulcers. It's been linked to tumors. It's definitely been linked to things like suicidal thoughts, suicide itself. Because, because pain and crisis and hurt, we were not made to keep that inside. That was made to come out. And that's why Jesus in Matthew 5, 4, he says, blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. Leave that up there for a second. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Here's Jesus, the master communicator, right? He's saying several things here, especially two. He's saying, take it at face value. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But here's what he's also saying. He's also saying, if you do not mourn, you will not be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But if you do not mourn, there is no promise for you. If you do not mourn, you will not be comforted. And this is how even Christians can go through crisis and we don't get God comfort because we don't do it God's way. And there is no promise for you if you do not mourn. But blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that's why we have to mourn. Let me, let me answer the, the question here. How do we mourn? How do we mourn? And that same time as I was learning about proud flesh, I actually found out how to treat proud flesh. And I was on a veterinarian website. That's probably the last time you'll hear a veterinarian website reference in a sermon in your life. So just write it down. It's a historic moment. Here's how you treat proud flesh. All right, get this. This is, this is veterinarian gospel, all right? Here's, here's, here's how you treat proud flesh. The body attempts to heal the wound too quickly. And as a result, the wound closes up on the outside without getting healed on the inside. In other words, in our context, we try and go through it too fast. We try and put the plastic face on. Everything's good, brother. Amen, glory, hallelujah, PTL, praise the Lord, I'm fine. And we're dying on the inside. The advice is to regulate the speed of the healing for the long-term health of the individual. The sooner treatment is initiated for a wound, the quicker healing will be accomplished and with minimal scarring. From the other view, when we see the worst of wounds, we must remain optimistic and proceed with treatment. All wounds will heal, some prettier than others, but heal they will. Do you hear that? I'm gonna read that last line again. All wounds will heal, some prettier than others, but heal they will. In other words, you have to be willing to go there. You have to be willing to face it. The treatment for, for proud flesh, when it looks good on the outside, but it's infected underneath, is to actually open the wound back up and to go through the process of allowing healing to come in. So we really have two options. Either look fine, but be toxic, or be willing to face some pain for long-term healing. I'd even say it like this. Sometimes to go forwards, you first have to go backwards. And I think there's a lot of us, if I can say it like this, there's a lot of us who say, brother, I'm carrying my cross, I'm walking the life, I'm following Jesus, I'm running the race. When Jesus looks at us and says, dude, you're not running the race, you are crawling the race. You are limping the race. And he says, would you just do this? Could you just sit down for a second and let me heal you so you could actually stand back up and then run the race? And a lot of us, we're driving our car 85 miles an hour down the interstate and we're saying, hey, mechanic, won't you come and work on it right now? And he's like, hey, could you just pull over, put it in park, turn, turn it off, take the keys out, and then I can work on it. We're like, no, 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 I'm good. Just do it from right there. Do it from right there. Do it while I'm still living. And we're like little five-year-old kids. Anybody in here have kids? Like, like five-year-old kids, they skin their knee and they're like, no, no you can't look at it. No, no, no. You, know, you ever have that? My, my kids are all boys. They're all boys. But when they get hurt, they will, they're like, get away from me. Right? Because it might hurt more for a moment to be healed. And so, no, 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 you can't even look at it. Heal it from over there. Do it from over there. And how do you think even today? Jesus is standing. He's like knocking. He's like, hey, can I come in? You're like, no, no, no. Fix me from out there. Fix me from the parking lot. I'm good right here. He says sometimes to move forwards for a moment, you have to move backwards. You have to sit down and let God heal you so then you can move forwards. When we were in Ethiopia, um, we met a, a man named Dr. Hinak, and uh, he was instantly one of my favorite people uh, on earth. And uh, uh, he, he's a guy who's always smiling. I don't know if you know anybody like this, um, like ear to ear. Like he's... he's like always, because he's so filled with the gospel, like he has so much happiness. I have to imagine he sleeps like that. He's like, <laughs> he's always so happy. And uh, he's literally a medical doctor. And so he went around and helped us out a lot uh, while we were going. But um, 
one of his callings, what he feels like he's called to is this thing called tribal reconciliation. And what he does, he goes in uh, to tribes uh, there in Ethiopia that may have been at war with each other or just long held disagreements, offense, um, uh, bitterness, have a history, whatever it is. And he says, what I want to do, I want to get these these two tribes together and I want to bring reconciliation through the gospel. I want to get them back together. I love that. That's the heart of the house. And uh, so he says, what I do, I actually get both tribes together all in the same place. He says it may be 500 people, it may be 50,000 people. And what I'll do, I'll bring the leaders up to the front and I'll just tell them to start telling their stories. And so one leader from the tribe says, "Um, my father was sold into slavery and he was yoked to an ox to plow a field. And the leader of the other tribe will stand up and say, My father sold your father. I'm sorry. And a little sniffle here. It says like a domino. Just mourning breaks out. It says you've never seen crying until you've seen 50,000 people cry. It says we go to lunch and we come back and there's still mourning. And he said this, I don't want to misquote him, he said this. He says, sometimes to heal the wound, you have to go into the wound. Sometimes to heal the wound, you have to go into the wound. Because guys, the idea is this, it's not just about mourning, it's not just about crying. Anybody can cry. It's about allowing God to touch the pain. It's about allowing... God, to pull the Band-Aid off a little bit and to come in and bring healing even when it hurts. Because when we don't do that, when we keep God at arm's length and just say, fix me from over there, we end up claiming promises that are not ours and we misquote scripture. And we find ourselves saying things like this. We say things, I've, I've said this before as well. Just say, God, give me the peace that passes all understanding that would guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Except there's a problem with that. That's not true. We do not pray and God just magically gives us this peace. There's a condition for peace. Let's read it, Philippians 4, verse six. This may be helpful for some of us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, what? Present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you want, there is a condition for the peace of God. There's a condition for the comfort of God. It's casting our cares on Jesus. And many times we're like, God, give me your peace. And he's like, I would love to. Why don't you give me your cares? If you give me your cares, I will give you my peace. Give me your hurts and I will give you my comfort. But don't just stand and lock me outside and say, God, give me peace from out there. He's like, it doesn't work that way. You have to allow me into the pain. You have to allow me into the crisis. You have to mourn because blessed are those who mourn because then I can come in and comfort them. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Guys, we we need to begin killing this idea. Can we do this today? that time heals all wounds. Time does not heal all wounds. If anything, time makes an infection worse. Time does not heal all wounds. Jesus heals all wounds. And when we go through crisis, we can't just say, no, 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 I'll be fine, I'll be fine, I'll get better. No, you won't. Because time doesn't heal your wounds. Jesus heals your wounds. And we have to allow God to touch the pain and we have to be willing to go there. In Jewish culture, there's this thing called sitting shiva. Maybe you've heard of it before, but it's basically this idea, there's there's numerous expressions of it, but here's the basic idea. If somebody close to you passes away, what is there's seven days where you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to cook, not allowed to clean, not allowed to run errands, right? You're not allowed to busy yourself. You can't run away from the pain. So for seven days, Here's the basic idea. You sit in a room, you turn off the light, you sit on the floor, and you light a candle. And you invite God into the room to begin the healing process. Because here's what I know. I don't wanna just keep living my life and the pain's always gonna be as fresh as it was the day that it happened. I say, I gotta face the pain, I gotta allow God into the pain today. 
And I just sit there, stare at that candle and say, God, it seems impossible, but I invite you into this moment. Other people can come over, but they can't say anything. You wanna know why? Because they probably say something stupid, <laughs> right? Probably show up and be like, hey, brother in the Lord, I was reading a poem this morning. I don't care about your poem. Give your poem to yourself. I don't care what Ralph Waldo Emerson has to say about this. You know, and they come over and rub your back. I don't need that. I don't need you to rub my back. Don't, here, here's what we do, especially Christians. We're the worst about this. We try and go in and be Jesus in the moment. We try and take Jesus's place. When Jesus is already at work, here's the deal. They can't talk unless you talk to them first. They can't touch you unless you ask for it. Because what I really need right now, I need the ministry of Jesus to come in and comfort me. Now, your just presence here, that's enough. Thank you for being here. You don't need to say anything. You don't even need to do anything because your words aren't gonna do it for me, okay? I need Jesus to come in and be Jesus. Sitting, Shiva, and at the end of seven days, you stand back up and you go back about your life and it's not that you forget the past, but now you don't have to focus on the past because God has begun the healing process on the inside. And that sounds terrible, but really what it is, it's healing. It's healing. And there's one more Jewish custom which I feel like will be helpful for us today. It's this. Some of you recognize this. It's a prayer shawl. Very Jewish. <laughs> and I share one of my um, most intimate moments with the Lord with this. And uh, what this is, in, in Hebrew, it's a talith. And tal is uh, a covering or even a tent. And eth is little. And so what you have here is a little tent. And um, if you see um, many um, devout Jews, you'll see them many times in prayer like this, or even in times of intense prayer, they can fully come in and be in a tent. And what I love about that is in a room full of hundreds of people, you can be all by yourself. The only body under here is me and Jesus. <laughs> And if you know um, some of my story, you know that uh, a number of years ago, many years ago, um, Summer and I had been married for a while and we we're having a hard time um, conceiving. And um, at that time, in fact, uh, she actually had a doctor tell her, hey, it's not gonna happen. Like, you're not gonna conceive. You should just try in vitro fertilization. Um, he was a great guy. We were a big fan of that guy. He was a good bedside manner. And, um, and so what it resulted in was a lot of complaining to God. And so I remember one day, very vividly, uh, I was driving home from work, I was complaining to God about this whole thing and parked my car, closed the door, got out, um, took two steps, and then it's clear as day, clear as day. I hear God say, their names will be Jeremiah and Isaac. And overjoyed, I run inside, I tell Summer, and God's made us a promise. And then we started feeling like Abraham and Sarah because it still wasn't happening. <laughs> and we're like, you know, the months go on, then we hit a year and it's like, okay, God, you, you can do this. And um, then one day come home and some are overjoyed, says, hey, I'm pregnant. You know, to re rejoice, to hug each other. And then nine months later it comes Jeremiah and um, joy of our lives. And uh, the months go on after that and come home again and Summer says, hey, I'm pregnant again. And here's Isaac, right? Uh, but something was different this time. And I still remember those emotions. And God, I pray I never feel those emotions again. There was this sinking feeling in my stomach of just like, this isn't right. Like this, like I should be overjoyed, but something on the inside of me just says, this is not right. And talking to her later, she actually felt exactly the same thing. And as the weeks went by, um, one day I come home and she says, hey, I've had a miscarriage. And I remember thinking, there goes Isaac. Hey, God, what about your promises? And all the dominoes start falling, right? And I'm like, God, what about this? And what about that? And why? And what? And, but I, I knew at the same time, right? Like, I got to be strong, right? Because a good Christian, you don't cry. You cry for a second. 
But then you gotta be strong, especially if you're a husband. You gotta lead the family. You gotta, you gotta put the game face on. You gotta be proud. You gotta, you gotta lead. You, you can't show sadness. You can't go there. You can't do that, especially because I'm a pastor and I gotta, I gotta get up and I gotta preach this week and I, I just can't go there. Yeah, I know we had told everybody that we're pregnant. Yeah, I know. But man, we're gonna be okay. We're trusting the Lord. We're gonna choose joy and all this. And so what happened though, everything on the outside was completely fine, but on the inside, there was an infection. And I, I don't think God's ever felt more distant during that time, ever in my life than during that time. It actually resulted in infusion. We were the fusion pastors back then, the young adult pastors, and we, uh, I preached a series um, called God on Mute. It was literally, where is God when life hurts? And at the end of one of those messages, we had a moment where we had a prayer shawl and it was available to everybody. And I sat down on the floor. I just finished preaching. I sat down on the floor and I pulled it up over my head, went inside the tent. There was just me and Jesus in there, even though he didn't feel like he was in there. And I found myself just praying. And I said, you know, God, I, I've been asking a lot of why questions. Right, we do that, right? When crisis happens, why this, why that? Why did that hurt happen? Why did that thing happen? Why did that memory happen? Why, where were you when? Why all this? And I found myself saying, I just said, God, I've been asking a lot of why questions, but today I'm just here to say this. Even if I never know why, I'll still choose to trust you and I'll still serve you and I'll still love you all the days of my life until I see you face to face. And I pray that on that day, it might make a little bit of sense. And right behind that, as clearly as I had heard him the first time, God said this, he's with me and his name is Joseph. I lost it because if that was Joseph, then God's promises were still true because he had said their names would be Jeremiah and Isaac, and now we have Isaac. But in that moment, here's what I discovered. I discovered why God doesn't usually answer our why questions because an answer is not going to do us any good. What's an answer going to do? And what I discovered in that moment is that better than any why is God's presence with me in the midst of the pain. And, and so many times in the midst of crisis, we pray, God, get me out of this. And more often times than not, rather than getting us out of it, he jumps into it with us. And he is an ever-present help in times of need. And he does what he does best, that he heals the brokenhearted. And so what I learned, what I learned, how do we move forward after crisis? What I learned is, is we have to let Christ into the crisis. We have to let Christ into the crisis. Because here's what I know, and I say this unashamedly, I say it unreservedly, full, full confidence, that when the world goes through crisis, they go through it alone. And that's a really bad place to be when you go through pain and heartache all by yourself. But here's what I say about us as the family of God, that when we go through crisis, you've never been alone. God is right there with us. He's never turned his back on you. In fact, when you started going through it, he jumped in it with you. And here's what I've discovered. I can't tell God when to speak. I can't tell God how to speak. I can't tell God what to say. But here's what I can do. I can position myself in a place to be comforted. It's blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we're gonna do that right now. We're gonna do that right now. So we're gonna share a time of worship. 
And um, ushers, you can go ahead and come forward. And here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. This may seem unorthodox for, for some of you, but we don't make time for this. So we're going to make time for this right now. Is that as I've been talking, the Lord may have already put his finger on something and says, yeah, that hurts. That needs healing. That needs healing. That needs healing. Maybe right before you. Maybe the dad wasn't there. It may be what they said. It may be what they did. I don't know. But God's been bringing it up. And here's what I pray. Maybe if you say, I'm not really sure. I'm not, I think I'm good. Here's what I just pray. If I'm you, here's what I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, reveal to me something that needs to be healed. All right? And we may say, well, that's not a big deal. No, 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 that's not, that's not a big deal. Let me, let me tell you, we are not in the business of telling God what's a big deal or what isn't a big deal. If God brings something up, he knows what you need to be healed from. And God is not a man that he should lie. And he has promised, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to share a time of, uh, of worship, a moment of worship here, just a handful of minutes. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, but right after that, um, I'd like us to all engage at this some level. You, some of you may want to sit in your seats and just kind of see what God's going to do there. But I would encourage you in just a moment, you can come forward. We have, we can call makeshift prayer shawls up here. Just the same thing as this without the stripes. And you can go inside your tent, which is you and Jesus. And you can mourn. You can go there and allow Christ into the crisis so we can move forward. Let me lead us in this prayer. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to pray this and maybe just kind of make it your own as I pray. God, here's what I pray for us over these next few minutes, Father. Here's what I say. I submit these memories to you. Submit the, the crisis to you the abuse to you, the pain to you, the, the loss to you. God, some of this stuff is really fresh right now. Some of this stuff could have happened years ago, but it feels like it happened right now. And God, right now, here's what we do. Just say this in your heart. I open up my emotions to you. I don't keep you locked out. I don't ask you to heal it from the outside. What I do right now, God, I begin the process of casting my cares on you because you care for me. I let you into my emotions. Begin the process of healing in me. It is a process. Begin the process of healing me from the stress, the pain, the guilt, the hurt, whatever it is. And today, you might want to say this, today I choose to forgive. And today I choose to be healed. In Jesus' name.